where did all the water come from on Earth? When Earth formed, it would have been uh, the result of a heavy bombardment and accretion process and all of that energy and the fact that the core was highly radioactive would have made it a molten ball of lava to begin with and way too hot to have had uh, liquid oceans. All the water would have been boiled away. So it seems like quite a puzzle as to explain where our oceans have come from. Now to do that, we need to understand one more little thing about the uh, nature of uh, isotopes of different elements. In discussing nuclear fusion, we've already talked about the uh, ideas of helium-3 and helium-4, and it depending on the number of neutrons. But just to go over it again, here's three isotopes of carbon. The ordinary carbon with six of each, six protons and six neutrons, carbon-13 with an extra neutron, and carbon-14 with two extra neutrons. That's radioactive, that's the one they use for carbon dating. But the same is true for hydrogen. You can have ordinary hydrogen with just a proton as the nucleus. You can have deuterium with a mass of two, one proton and one neutron, and tritium with a mass of three because it's got two neutrons and a proton in the center. Again, that's unstable. They used to use it for uh, making glowing dials on watches and things. Now, deuterium, we call it by a special name rather than calling it hydrogen 2, because really it's sufficiently different that it does make quite a bit of uh, difference to its behavior as, a, as an element in its own right almost. That uh, doubling of the mass is uh, the most significant change b between two isotopes of any two elements. In fact, here's a little example. The mass of water consisting of D2O, two, two deuteriums and our oxygen is 20, if you add it up, two lots of two and one lot of 16 for the oxygen, compared to the 18 of ordinary water. Now that's only 10%, but in the uh, wine glasses at the bottom there, the one on the right is ordinary water because the ice is floating. The one on the left, that's made with deuterium and it changes the game completely and the ice sinks instead. Uh, a very, very important feature of ordinary water is that the ice floats to the top and forms a protective screen that then keeps the rest of it liquid underneath. And that may well have been key to the survival of life on Earth. If the uh, whole of the Earth's oceans had been made of heavy water, deuterium based, things would have been rather different. But they're not. And in fact, our oceans contain 156 of those deuterium nuclei for every million of the ordinary hydrogens. And it's interesting to compare that with the rest of the universe and with what Fred Hoyle would have predicted from the bang nucleosynthesis point of view. Actually, when the music stopped, when this uh, chain of fusion was going on, suddenly the temperature cooled so that these processes couldn't happen anymore, the amount of deuterium left was tiny very very small indeed. This is because it's very easy for it to turn into helium-3, that's a very quick process, we talked about that. So how much deuterium did the uh, Big Bang make? When we look out there in the universe now, we find that any deuterium get in the middle of stars is destroyed and used up as fast as it's made. And so we can't really tell from stars. But if we look out at the uh, rest of the universe, we find that 26 parts per million, in other words, 26 deuteriums for every million hydrogens, is uh, pretty much the, uh, the average composition out there of uh, the rest of the, the universe that we see. Really quite a small fraction. If we look at Jupiter, 
That consists, uh, well, largely of hydrogen, in fact, as the other elements present as well. But if we look at the hydrogen, we find 26 parts per million of deuterium compared to ordinary hydrogen. So it seems that Jupiter is pretty much a ball of unmodified uh, material which shares the signature of the Big Bang. On Earth, it's much more than that. It's 156 time, uh, parts per million, not 26. Six times as much as the universe at large. A little bit strange, really. And uh, one of the possibilities is that the lighter hydrogen could escape out to space and leak away slightly faster than the heavier deuterium. But it still begs the question, where did we get all of this water from? And one of the possibilities is that it was delivered late after the Earth had cooled down by the impact of comets. This is Comet Hale Bop. And you can see here its nucleus, its dust tail, and its uh, secondary ion tail there. Amazing photograph. I remember when this uh, was visible in the sky almost every night. There's a picture of Comet Halley that was taken by the Giotto probe as it flew past looking at the nucleus of the uh, comet in great detail. And by these uh, studies of these objects from these various missions, we worked out that comets are basically dirty snowballs and that snow contains a lot of water. And you can see that in the spectrum up to the right there. And so comets do fall to earth and they do deliver some water to us. We also get hit by showers of meteorites, and some of these also contain the uh, remnant fragments of comets. So we can uh, have a look and compare the amount of deuterium in the comets with the amount of deuterium we find on Earth and see if it matches. That would tell us the answer that uh, our water was coming from comets. Well, hail bop. 200, Halley's Comet 200, Comet Hartley 161. Now our, our ocean was 156, so yeah, not too bad a fit really. This is looking good. Then the Rosetta mission had a look at uh, 67P, Jerimov Gerasimenko, and it's 450 on that comet. That's uh, three times as much as we have. So that doesn't really sound like very good match at all. Well, one of the things we've got to remember is that uh, the action of the sun and the solar wind on these objects is important. If you have any sort of gaseous atmosphere, uh, be it permanent or temporary around an object, the earth or a large comet, then uh, that atmosphere will be at a particular temperature and the energy of the molecules will be distributed between the different types equally so that they all the types have the same energy. It's a law of physics called the equipartition of energy. And what this means is that their speed of the lighter molecules must be greater because the energy is a half the velocity squared times the mass and so if the velocity has to go up if the mass goes down so you can see that hydrogen will be moving faster than helium faster than water and then nitrogen and then oxygen at the same temperature in a mixture of those gases and what that means is that you can look at the escape velocity due to gravity of the different objects in the solar system and figure out whether or not, given their temperature, uh, the uh, gases should stay put or escape to space. So if we plot the positions with temperature across the bottom and escape velocity up the side, you can see that down at the bottom, we've got the little objects of the moon and Mercury, and pretty much everything manages to escape, even the relatively heavy carbon dioxide molecules are moving fast enough to get away. 
Then we have things like Titan and Mars and Venus, and they're managing to hang on to uh, things quite well. Earth just uh, outside the water line there, and Triton as well. But they're both below the helium and hydrogen escape lines, whereas the giant planets are not. They're much more massive, and so they manage to hang on to all of those gases, including the volatile ones. So this kind of explains, really, what we find in the atmospheres of the uh, different uh, planets quite well.